Migrants ford the Suchiate River from Guatemala into Mexico after the crossing was closed. An inquest is opened into South Africa trade unionist and anti-apartheid activist Neil Agat's death 38 years after he was found hanging in his cell. And the new head of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Quds Force condemns U.S. cowardice. Hello and welcome to Telesur English. I am Estefania Bravo. This is from the South. Central American migrants in Guatemala are crossing the Suchiate River into Mexico. Close to 3,000 Honduran migrants had been waiting to cross the Rodolfo Robles border bridge in the Cunumán, but Mexican authorities closed the crossing as part of an agreement the government has with the United States to cut down irregular migration through its territory. Reports state the migrants gave authorities a deadline to open the crossing before looking for alternative points of entry into Mexico. This latest migrant caravan from Honduras set off on their journey north last Wednesday, fleeing a nation with the highest rates of poverty and violence in Central America. Well, they don't want to allow us to pass practically. What's the reason? No one wants to talk. If they wanted to allow people to pass, they would have already done it. That's a lie. If they were really going to do it, they would have already had people standing in a line and would have people entering through one entryway. But that's not the logic. Everyone is going peacefully. The only thing we want is to cross. Legally, they don't want to allow it, so people want to enter by force. Our correspondent was at the border when the Mexican authorities denied the migrants' request to enter the country. I'm here at the border where recently the Mexican authorities announced the migrants that they will not be able to enter Mexican territory. They are now discussing the Mexican government's proposal which offered them to enter in groups of 20 and that women, children and pregnant women be prioritized. The migrants said they don't agree with the proposal and reiterated their desire to pass through the Mexican border. There is now a disagreement between the migrants, a group that wants to move forward through other routes and another Another group that wants to wait. Hundreds of people in the Brazilian state of Belo Horizonte have embarked on a six-day protest march against mining giant the Vale almost a year after 259 people were killed when a dam owned by the company collapsed. The protesters will march through various mining towns before assembling at Vales's office in the town of Brumandinho where the disaster occurred. They aim to expose the government's lack of will to hold the company responsible for the hundreds of deaths and injuries. Authorities have so far failed to indict any of Valle's, Valle's executives. Our correspondent Brian Muir has more from Sao Paulo. On January 25th, 2019, shortly after far-right Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro took office, there was a horrible disaster in the town of Brumadinho in Minas Gerais state. The Valley Mining Corporation had a large lake of toxic waste that it was maintaining there, and the containing wall broke. It burst, and toxic mud poured out over the town, killing 250 people. The resulting mudslide killed the Paruapeba River for hundreds of kilometers, and this affected the livelihoods of 1.3 million people who live in 48 towns along the riverbanks who were using that water for drinking and for agricultural purposes. Now today, on January 20th, a group of hundreds of survivors of that tragedy began a protest march in the state capital of Belo Horizonte. They're going to march from Belo Horizonte to Brumadinho. It's 300 kilometers, arriving there on the 25th to mark the one-year anniversary of the disaster. Along the way, they're going to have seminars and talk with people, and it's expected that the crowd of people marching is going to grow as it approaches its final destination. It's being sponsored by the Landless Rural Workers Movement, the MST, and also by the MAB, the mov movement of people affected by dams. And they're protesting a lack of response from both the government, the federal government, the state government, and the Valley Mining Company, which, although it gave some kind of settlement 
to the families of the people killed in the disaster hasn't done anything for the estimated 1 million people who now have toxic metal poisoning due to their irresponsibility as a company. Thank Brian Muir for that report. Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza is in Iran on an official visit. Minister Arreaza met with Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Sarif. During their meeting, they discussed new bilateral projects in the agricultural, industrial, and scientific sectors, among others. This high-level visit by Arreaza seeks to strengthen cooperation uh, bonds between the two nations and follows a similar diplomatic visit to the Bolivarian delegation to China last week. In further diplomatic success for the Bolivarian government, the Pemón uh, Pem indigenous people in Venezuela will soon be seeing the reputation of the Abuela Cueca Stone as it begins its weeks-long journey back from Berlin, 22 years after it was stolen. The Jasper Stone, which weighs around 30 tons and represents a prison, a uh, person tuned into stone was taken from the Canaima National Park, a UNESCO World Heritage Site to Germany in 1998. The government at this time under President Rafael Caldera handed over the sacred stone despite protests by the Pemón people. The Grandma Cueca is the representation of a wise elderly woman and its a place of origin is another stone symbolizing the grandfather, both ancestors of the Pemón people. The return of the Grandma Cueca to the Santa Cruz de Mapauri is the result of the years of struggle by the indigenous peoples themselves and of diplomatic by the Bolivarian government. Bolivia's the post-president Evo Morales announced the official presidential tickets for the MAS party in the upcoming May 3rd elections. Former Finance Minister Luis Arce was chosen to run for president, while, foreign, while former Foreign Minister David Choquehuanca is the candidate for vice president. The announcement was made in Buenos Aires, Argentina on Sunday. El candidato. The candidate for the movement towards socialism, political instrument for the sovereignty of the peoples, is Luis Arce Catacora. <laughs> candidate for vice president, taking into account the proposal of the Unity Pact, we want to inform that our candidate for vice president is David Choquehuanca. Bolivia's de facto government has deployed troops to intimidate supporters of the movement towards socialism party ahead of planned protests against the de facto administration on January 22nd. Journalist Oliver Vargas says the presence of the armed troops foreshadows the repression that could come. Hundreds of troops in the center of La Paz in Plaza San Francisco um, doing military drills, marching about, and the, the purpose of that is really to intimidate people ahead of possible protests against the coup on the 22nd of January. Um, various social movements said that they want to go to La Paz to, um, to protest against the government. And this was a show of force saying that you're not, um, you know, you're not going to be able to, to march where you want. The, 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 the military is preparing for uh, or war style operations if, uh, if marchers do arrive to the city. So, yeah, as I said, it's, it's about intimidating um, the people. And it's, this is something that took place not just in La Paz, but in every capital city of the nine departments of Bolivia. CARICOM head Mia Amor Motley says her country will be boycotting a meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in Jamaica set for Tuesday. The Barbados Prime Minister said the decision was taken as only some regional heads were invited and moved, she dubbed, divisive. I am conscious that in the next week questions will be asked as to whether the Barbados Foreign Minister happened to be missing from a meeting in Kingston, in Jamaica, that will take place on Tuesday. And we don't look to pick fights. I don't look to pick fights. But I am conscious that if this country does not stand for something, then it will fall for anything. As Chairman of CARICOM, it is impossible for me to agree that my foreign minister should attend a meeting with anyone to which members of CARICOM are not invited. If some are invited and not all, then it is an attempt to divide this region. 
And starting Tuesday, Pompeo will be in Jamaica for a two-day visit where he will meet with Prime Minister Andrew Holmes and several other Caribbean leaders. They are expected to discuss the recent flare-up in the Middle East and matters pertaining to Venezuela. This visit is a year after the Jamaican Prime Minister and four other regional heads met with U.S. President Donald Trump in Florida. The White House had tried to bribe countries to vote against the legitimate Venezuelan government of President Nicolas Maduro with potential investment and an organization of American states for. With the murder toll at 26 so far this year, Trinidad and Tobago's National Security Minister has raised questions about who stands to benefit, to benefit from crime. This as he implied that criminal elements are being encouraged to commit heinous acts. Why is it that suddenly there are these instances, people driving along certain main roads and just being shot at? Police officers, on some instances, who were shot at, but there was absolutely no intelligence or no link of them to anything whatsoever. And we began looking at it. We then began to put certain pieces of the puzzle together, that there are certain people in our society who want to create the impression and create a sense of fear and a create a sense of panic in Trinidad and Tobago about what they call the runaway rate of crime. We'll be back in just a minute with the latest stories from Africa. Stay with us. Welcome back. A South African court has opened an inquest into the death of trade unionist and anti-apartheid activist Neil Agut, 38 years after his death. Agut, a medical doctor and trade unionist, was found hanging in his cell on February 5th of 1982 at the notorious John Borsters police station in Johannesburg, 70 days after being held in detention without trial. Authorities at the time claimed that he committed suicide, but his family and fellow activists have insisted that he was tortured to death during interrogations. More than 30 witnesses are expected to testify Good at the inquest. And the reality is that they were brutally tortured um, and the security branch had to find means of covering up their heinous activities and they came up with these issues of committing suicide or jumping from a window or slipping on a bar of soap. So it's imperative that the Agate family has an opportunity to revisit the inquest findings of the 80s and that the, the ultimate truth emerges. Africa's third largest airline, South African Airways, has denied reports that it is seizing operations after it failed to meet the deadline to secure a bailout from the government. A statement by the airline said all flights will operate normally while the management continues to engage the National Treasury for 140 million U.S. dollar bailout. The funding is part of a bankruptcy protection deal the airline signed with its creditors late last year. The airline, once Africa's largest, has in the last decade suffered a deterioration of its finances due to gross mismanagement. The Zimbabwean government has announced measures to revive floundering state companies. The country's vice president said the government has come up with a strategy to bring back companies which have either closed down or have been hurt due to economic hardships. As part of the, of the program, the country has already started receiving new planes from Malaysia to strengthen the national airline. Most of the country's industries have suffered due to crippling sanctions imposed by the United States and its European partners. The government's commitment to the revival of state enterprises and parastatals has taken a new direction and a new trust. As you may be, as you may all recall, state enterprises and parastatals used contribute around 40% of the country's gross domestic product. Unfortunately, most of, if not all, of these public entities have suffered from a host of challenges, including the economic decline caused by illegal sanctions, 
imposed upon us by determined and unashamed perpetrators of underdevelopment in third world countries. And the African Union has intensified its fight against sanctions imposed on Zimbabwe. During a recent state visit to the country, the African Union's chairman to the panel of the WISE, Amri Mosa, said the bloc has agreed to increase pressure for the sanctions to be unconditionally removed. The implications of the sanctions on the economy, on development of the country, on the uh, society on the poor people, on the young people, on the women, etc. We discussed all that. The uh, consensus uh, amongst us, the AU representatives and uh, the uh, high officials of this country was that we have to work together to lift the sanctions as quickly as we can. Meanwhile, students in Zimbabwe's second capital, Bulawayo, have demonstrated against the deteriorating education system. Hundreds abandoned classes and took to the streets protesting against the rising cost of education, poor working conditions for teachers, and a lack of proper facilities. Recently, the government froze the cost of school as a way of relieving parents from the heavy, already high cost of living. Libya's Prime Minister has called for the international community to put pressure on Khalifa Haftar to release oil fields recently seized by his forces. Prime Minister Fayez al sarraj said Libya faces a catastrophe if the eastern-based commander does not lift the blockade he has put in place on the country's oil field. Haftar's forces closed Libya's major oil, oil port on Friday, resulting in the reduction of production. Britain says they are banking on the support of Africa after their exit from the European Union at the end of this month. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson said he is targeting Africa as an ideal business partner in post-Brexit engagements, but the UK faces already established partnerships with China and Russia. And only a few, a few African heads of state attended the first UK-Africa Investment Summit. More than half the world's fastest, uh, 15 fastest growing economies are in Africa, two-thirds of African, African economies are expanding faster than the global average. Africa is the future and the UK has a huge and active role to play in that future. We want to build a new future as a global free trading nation. That's what we're doing now. That's what we'll be embarking on on the 31st of January of this month. But I want to intensify and expand that trade. Still to come, French workers rejecting pension reform are met with police violence. Stay with us. Welcome back. The new Iranian Quds Force commander has vowed to avenge the assassination of his predecessor, Qasem Soleimani. The newly appointed commander, Ismail Ghani, said Soleimani was killed in what he described as a cowardly way by the United States. The United States hit Qasem Soleimani in a cowardly way, but with God's grace and through endeavors of freedom seekers around the world who want vengeance over his blood, we will hit his enemy in a manly fashion. Two protesters and two police officers were killed in the Iraqi cities of Baghdad and Basra on Monday as anti-government protests resumed. The two protesters were killed in Baghdad's Tehran Square after security forces used live ammunition, raising the death toll at the hands of the state to over 450 since protests started in October. Meanwhile, in Basra, two policemen were run over by a civilian car, sources said. The driver was reportedly trying to avoid the clashes. Demonstrators say Prime Minister Abdel Abdul Mahdi has not fulfilled any of his promises, including an overhaul of a corrupt political system that has kept most Iraqis in poverty. The deadline given to the government ended today. We are going to escalate our protests until they meet our demands. We will never give up the escalation. We are not bored. We will stay in tents. We will never return. As long as there is no homeland, we won't go back to normal life. We have been here for four months. We have surpassed the 100 days, and they have not met our demands. These days are the last days of those rules. 
A new SARS-like virus has killed at least three people in China with almost 140 new cases discovered over the weekend in the city of Wuhan. Authorities have implemented the use of body temperature cameras at the Wuhan railway station and airport to detect the infection, expressing fear the epidemic could turn into a major outbreak as millions began traveling for the Lunar New Year. First discovered in the central city of Wuhan, the virus has caused alarm because of its connection to severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS for short. Over 200 people have been diagnosed with the virus in China. I would like to emphasize that since the epidemic started, the Chinese side has taken serious, earnest and professional attitude to actively deal with it and formulate a strict prevention and control plan. We are sparing no effort in threatening patients and in managing those who have close contact them. We have launched a thorough epidemiological investigation and have released relevant information about epidemic prevention and control in timely manner, and have actively launched publicity campaigns on disease prevention knowledge. Still in China, a 6.4 magnitude earthquake has hit the country's Xinjiang region, injuring at least three people. Evacuations are underway after some residents in the region said that the strong tremors greatly shook multi-story residential buildings. Moving on, gun control remains a poorly managed issue in the United States as once again a mass shooting has left two dead and uh, several injured in the state of Kansas. Police officials have confirmed that a gunman had opened fire inside a bar on Sunday night, killing two on the spot and injuring about 15. It has not been established what the motive was as the suspect was also found dead at the scene. At about 11.30 tonight, officers were actually in the area, uh, 40 Highway and Nolan Road when a disturbance started and there was a shooting. Upon arrival, they found quite a chaotic scene and they had to call in officers from all over uh, the metro area in order to stabilize the scene before they could start uh, the investigation. Once they began the investigation, they found one adult male deceased in the parking lot, one adult female deceased in the parking lot. Um, we believe that the shooter that started this incident is one of the deceased and the preliminary investigation preliminary investigation looks as though um, an armed security guard working at the establishment stopped the shooter Hundreds of protesters have been met with police repression during a march in the city of Versailles, France. Protesters are on the streets to protest against pension reform, while President Emmanuel Macron holds a Choose France summit nearby. The French president is hosting executives from all over the world to praise a France, a France that welcomes companies with open arms. Workers have condemned the Mac uh, Macron's administration draft pension reform bill that includes a contested clause on raising the retirement age by two years to six among other things. Clearly, the government is refusing to withdraw this reform. This reform is unjust, and we can see it. In fact, they have granted several benefits to certain sectors, notably the police, and now they're not going to be affected. And we realize that the reform for equality for all workers is actually a sham. It's worthless. It's a demonstration that's been declared. So we were right in front. We were pushed. They wanted us to turn back, to stay on the square, in front of the Versailles Chantier station, simply so that we don't make a noise and are not visible. That's all. So we were actually pushed back. So we tried to put our hands up to show that we are not violent and that we are here to demonstrate. It's a right. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesonenglish.net. And join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesonenglish, I am Estefania Bravo. Until next time.